Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Wednesday's seminar. Today we are joined by Richard Silva, Senior Partner at Silver Shemmings Ash and Richard is going to be talking to us about termination. Leave site now and don't come back. As always, um, if you have any questions, Richard is delighted to answer them, but if you could put them in the Q&A tool in the bottom toolbox there um, and he will get to those at the end, assuming he hasn't already answered it during the presentation. And if there's something more specific you wanted to speak to Richard about, please don't hesitate to email him directly, richardsilver at silverllp.com. So without any more ado, Richard, it's over to you. Thank you, Julie. Good morning to you all. Um, my background is in construction. Um, interestingly, the very first project that I was involved in, I learned the hard way about termination. Um, I, I was brought on as an assistant QS on a large re new build of a um, sports center. And the brick layer on that site, to our mind, was not doing a very good job. Um, loads and loads of problems. And we felt if we were going to complete the job, we needed to get another brick layer on. So we chucked off our existing subcontractor. Um, but unfortunately, the process that we adopted wasn't right. We didn't follow the issue of the relevant notices under what was at the time JCT 1980. That's how long ago it was. Um, and equally, it was found that we hadn't complied with the requirements under the common law. The result was that notwithstanding they'd done a terrible job, we ended up paying them lots of damages. Um, so it was a lesson learned right at the beginning of my career that you had to follow the necessary requirements either under the common law or under the contract to successfully get rid of a subcontractor. And that's what we're going to cover now. Um, for those of you who are not aware, I'm also um, an adjudicator on the RICS panel, um, and I have recently completed three decisions, all dealing with the issue of termination. It seems to be very much a common issue at the moment with parties seeking to argue that the other party has either wrongfully terminated or repudiated. Um, and with these situations, it is very rare that a party will accept that they're at fault, allowing the other party to terminate. What often happens is, is both parties seek to argue that the other is responsible. And sometimes it can be very difficult to find out which party is right. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you should have a clearer picture of what is required. Now, in order to terminate, you can do it one of two ways. You can either terminate under the contract where the contract has provisions for termination, for example, under the JCT or NEC, or you can terminate under the common law. Generally, most contracts, if they have an express provision for termination, still allow termination under the common law. Circumstances where you would not be allowed to terminate terminate under the common law is where the contract expressly provides that that right is not included. That doesn't apply, for example, under the JCT. So very simply, we can either terminate under the contract, whereby the employment of the contractor is brought to an end, but the contract is retained. It is not brought to an end. Or we terminate under the common law, where the contract as a whole is brought to an end. And the ramifications for each can be quite different. Now, to start with, we're going to deal with termination under the common law. And in order to terminate, there must have been a fundamental breach of a condition as opposed to a warranty. Now, if we look at, for example, the JCT, it is called the JCT Conditions of Contract. The term I'm referring to here as condition is slightly different. In every contract, there are certain provisions that are said to go to the very root of the contract. They are the very basis of what the contract is and are hence considered as conditions. Those that are maybe not quite so important are considered as warranties. 
what we're trying to do is to determine which clauses are conditions and which are warranties. Now, surprisingly, it isn't that easy because what we actually have is a number of terms that are called innominate or intermediate terms. And what they're meaning is, is that they could be a condition or they could be a warranty depending upon the circumstances. And I'll give you a prime example, payment. Really, the employer is meant to pay monies by a certain date. If he hasn't done it, he's in breach. If he only pays it one day late, has that gone to the very heart of the contract? Is that a breach of a fundamental term? Quite clearly, it is unlikely to be the case. So it would be a breach of a warranty. Well, what happens if it's at the end of the job and a day goes past, a month goes past, a year goes past? Sooner or later, it will be seen as a breach of a condition. Let's deal with performance. Quite often, contractors, in my experience, don't finish on time. But that may not be the breach of a condition. They finish one day late. The employer is entitled to, on the most contracts, liquidated damages. It would not be seen as a, a justified reason for terminating on the date for completion if the contract is deemed or is anticipated to complete the following day. So conditions are requirements or obligations on one of the parties that is considered to be fundamental. So let's go through some of these fundamental obligations. Quite clearly, if the employer fails to enable the contractor to be able to undertake the works, for example, in not being able to give sufficient possession of the works, that is likely to be a breach of a fundamental term. And the other thing that's often referred to is repudiation. That is where a party has breached such a fundamental term. He has rebuted, he has committed a repudiatory breach. One that quite often happens is where a party actually says, go, we don't want you to complete these works, get lost. By so doing, they've not got good reason to do it. And a clear and unjustified order not to complete the works is a repudiation. And in one of the decisions I've given only recently, that is exactly what happened. Uh, the parties weren't very happy with each other. They were discussing about bringing the contract to an end. Ultimately, no agreement was reached, but nevertheless, one of the parties simply said, go. They thereafter then sought to cover their tracks by issuing notice and the like, but by which time it was all too late that actually instructed the other party to leave site. And quite clearly, that must be fundamental. Your whole obligation under a contract is to carry out the works. And if the other party tells you they don't want you to, they don't want to be bound by the contract anymore. They've repudiated. Another one that I must admit, when I was in construction many, many years ago, we often fell foul of is employing others to carry out the works of the particular contractor. You cannot do that. So if you've placed an order with someone to do some certain amounts of works, they must be allowed to do that. What you cannot do is to omit those works and then give them to others. Lots of people then say, well, surely that's what the contract provides for. Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. What the contract JCT and most contracts provide for is the omission of works. It doesn't provide for omit the works and give to others. The whole idea of omitting it is because you don't want the works to be undertaken, but it doesn't mean omit the works and give to others. So that would be a breach. And where you give a large element of those works to others, then that is likely to be a repudiation. So be careful. Another one that quite often happens is the supplementing of labor. You've got a job that's not going that well, you're behind program. So what you do is either take work away or knowing that you shouldn't do that, you suddenly deploy to site additional resources and then seek to charge the contractor for those resources. Well, you simply can't do that unless, underlined, 
the contract expressly provides. And none of the JCT or NEC do so provide. And indeed, most of the subcontracts I see don't provide for this either. So by seeking to supplement the contractor's labor on site, you're indicating that you're not bound by the contract. You are not giving him the opportunity to complete those works because instead you are seeking to complete those works by deploying other labor. By so doing, that will be a repudiation. Now we've been dealing with breaches by um, the employer. Another one that often comes to prime importance is payment. Generally, the simple failure to pay monies by the due date or the failure to pay the amounts applied for will not be a repudiation. I suppose the starting point is, is that in my experience, both when, I, both when I worked in construction and now, is the amount that's been applied for by the contractor quite often, dare I say, is not the proper value of the works undertaken. Indeed, when I used to work in construction, we used to have to produce a reconciliation for each month's valuation. And we'd actually had to identify amounts of monies that we'd been paid in advance because we'd overclaimed so that we could do a proper reconciliation. And my senior QS used to put quite a lot of pressure on me to ensure that we indeed did ask for slightly more money than we were entitled to. So simply the fact that a contract, an employer doesn't pay the contractor what they've applied for is not going to be a repudiation. They're not indicating they don't want to be bound by the contract. All they're indicating is, is they don't agree with your valuation. But it's a little bit clearer where they fail to pay by the final date for payment. Now, simply failing to pay in one situation, in one circumstance, in one interim application, will not be a repudiation. As you can see on the bottom bullet there, there was a particular case where there's a failure to pay three installments, but nevertheless, it was not held to be a repudiation. What we've got to look at is why have they not paid? What have they not paid and when was it? And depending upon the circumstances, it may, and I emphasize, it may be a repudiation. The closer to the end of the project, the more likely it's going to be a repudiation. Also, the language put and the reason for not paying may indicate a repudiation. But for those of you who are listening who are contractors, unfortunately, I'm afraid, simply the employer not paying in most circumstances will not entitle you to bring the contract to an end to terminate. One obvious one is where the contractor abandons site. You have an obligation as a contractor to carry out and complete the works. As we're gonna go through in a moment, you have an obligation to do that with due diligence. But if you remove all your resources from the site prior to completion, you are indicating you no longer want to carry out the works. You are committing what is known an anticipatory breach. You are indicating that in the future, you do not want to carry out those works. And by so doing, you are likely to have repudiated the contract. If you're gonna to try to argue against this, you're gonna to have to show some very special explanation as to why you've removed resources. And the most common one is, is that there are no areas of work available to you, but you're gonna to have to prove it. It's my experience that quite often resources are removed from site because of a lack of payment. I'm sure you're all aware under the Construction Act, there is now a right for parties to issue a seven day notice of their intention to suspend the works. They are entitled to issue this after the employer has failed to pay payment by the final date for payment. So as soon as the final date for payment has elapsed and you have yet to receive payment, you can then issue a seven day notice of intention to suspend. Subject to having issued that seven day notice and with seven days having elapsed, you can then suspend all or parts of the works. 
but you can only do that if you've issued the seven day notice. So the fact the employers failed to pay by the final date for payment, if you have not issued a seven day notice and or you have not allowed the seven days to elapse, but nevertheless seek to suspend, you will have committed a repudiatory breach, a breach of a condition which may well lead to the employer terminating. So do be careful. If you are looking to suspend all or part of the works, ensure that you've issued a compliant seven day notice and have allowed the seven days to elapse. Now, the one area more often than not that ends up in dispute is with regards to progress. Now, under most contracts, there is an obligation to proceed with due diligence. And indeed, the term or the provision for due diligence is often seen as an implied term, even where it is not expressly stated in the contract. But what does due diligence mean? Well, one of the problems is, is under most contracts, the employer will require the contractor or the contractor, the subcontractor, to carry out the works in a particular sequence or seek to complete the works in a certain order. However, unless the contract expressly provides for such sequencing, the contractor and or the subcontractor can complete the works in any order or sequence they like, provided they complete it by the completion date. And that could mean, for example, that they spend 70% of the contract doing 30% of the work and 30% of the contract duration doing 70%. Or they can work from the left to the right or the top from the bottom. They can do it in their own program sequence. Now, quite often, um, contractors, particularly in subcontractors, include programs or that the subcontractor shall meet with the contractor's program, but more often than not, those subcontracts fail. And the reason for that is, is that they are inconsistent. If, and what often happens, a subcontract incorporates by reference, for example, the JCT domestic subcontract form, this provides for certain information to be provided and stated but quite often in the subcontractors actually drafted, it doesn't include that information or that information is in the wrong place, or they include a program which is inconsistent. And where there is such inconsistency, what is likely to be found is that the contractor or the subcontractor has a simple obligation to carry out and complete the works by the completion day. So for subcontractors, and particularly things like M&E, I would strongly suggest to you that within your subcontract, you need to provide correctly a requirement that the subcontractor has to start elements of their work within a window. So you might say, for example, that first fix must start between the 1st of January and the 1st of February, subject to seven days notice. And then you will say that the first fix must be started uh, completed within a 12 week period. So you've got flexibility on the start date and you've got a stipulated duration for the first fix. And then you would break down the second fix and then you might then the, then the third uh, final fix, commissioning and so on and so forth. Where you're gonna want them to start, for example, at the west end of the project and move across to the east, you need to state that and ensure that the contract is adequately put together to enable you to oblige the subcontractor to comply with that. But what I would say to you is more often than not, I find that this is simply not the case. And indeed, quite often what I do when I'm instructed by subcontractors and where they are behind program is to actually ask to undertake works in the opposite direction to what the contractor requires. For the simple reason, they're not gonna be ready. And in that they're not ready, I can then claim extensions of time and dare I say, loss and expense and get out of 
potential termination issues and breach of due diligence. But so far as due diligence is concerned, unless there are clear and express provisions for the sequencing, what the contractor or subcontractor has to do is to meet with the completion date. But what happens when time is at large, where there is no completion date? Well, where the contractor has issued a previous subcontract, a previous program, or where there was originally a completion date stipulated but has been rendered at large, you should still use that as a basis of assessing performance. And for matters that are outside of the subcontractor's or contractor's control, you need to take that in establishing whether they're carrying out the works with reasonable due diligence and to complete in a reasonable time. But what you can see is it can be far, far more difficult. Clearly, if they're way behind in the first quarter of the contract duration, their argument is going to be is that they can complete easily still by accelerating the works. And if you don't give them an opportunity, you're likely to be repudiating the contract. So again, where they're failing to where you are arguing that they're failing to proceed with due diligence, it will be far easier to show this after the original contract completion date or near to the end of the contract completion date where there are large elements of the works not being completed. Clearly, a failure to proceed with the works at all, having suspended, is going to be much easier to prove as a breach than failing to proceed with due diligence. Um, I've had a number of disputes before me where it is quite clear the contractor is not really performing that well. But I have found, simply because of the amount of time that is left, the amount of resources that are on site and what progress has been achieved, there has not been a repudiation. Do remember, what we're looking to see is, is whether the contractor no longer wants to be bound by the contract, that is incapable of carrying out those works. So if he's proceeding with some diligence, maybe not as much as you want, and it is the beginning of the project, it is very unlikely to be seen as a repudiation. Quite often in seeking to get over that situation, there are references to being of the essence. Of the essence means that it is a condition. I should stress that simply by putting of the essence will not make those provisions necessarily a condition because what the courts will do is to look at the whole contract as a whole and to see if that essence term is consistent with others. And where you see time is of the essence, yet there is provisions for extension of time, the two don't seem quite right. If I'm going to give you more time, for example, for weather, time isn't of the essence. It isn't vitally important because I've actually allowed you more time. So it will be inconsistent and quite often it will be seen that time will not be seen as a condition. Um, the next one is defective work. And again, you know, one of the fundamental reasons why employers terminate is because they believe that the contractor just cannot complete their works. They're useless. And if you've issued an instruction to the contractor to rectify works, and those works are not rectified, and they prevent following works being undertaken, then that may well be a breach of a fundamental term. So what we've dealt with in the first instance is the situation where there has been a breach of a condition. One condition, one term of the contract, which is seen to be so serious that it entitles a party to terminate. But quite often what you find is, is it is not one simple failure. It is a whole category of failures that basically are the reason you want to chuck off site the subcontractor or the contractor. And where you can see that the failures are so often occurring, they're so protracted, they just continue to do so many failures, then overall these failures, when all added up together, 
show either that they are unwilling to carry out and complete the works and or that they're simply unable to carry out the works. They're just so incompetent that they could never finish. And on such basis, you would be able to terminate. So in this situation, you want to be able to record all their failures and by, for example, the use of photographs, and you want to be recording them and requesting them to put them right. And if you can show that there are just so many failures and that they simply cannot put them right and they keep repeating those failures, then you may well be able to terminate for a repudiation. The third um, item where you can actually terminate is where there has been an anticipatory breach where a party says they no longer want to be bound by the contract in the future. An example of that is, is if I were to say to you today, I know I'm meant to be coming to site next week to start the works, but I don't intend to. Now, I don't even have an obligation to start till next week, but I've told you today, well in advance that I don't want to carry out the works, and by so doing, I've committed an anticipatory breach where an employer says they have no intention to pay them any further monies in the future, and even though no monies are due to, to date, that again would be an anticipatory breach. And where you have committed an anticipatory breach, the other party is entitled to elect to accept that repudiation, thereby bringing the contract to an end. Um, the next item where a party can potentially terminate is where the contract so provides. So if you put in the contract that if the contractor does X wrongly, we can terminate. But you have to ensure that that contract is properly drafted to that effect. Now, quite obviously, JCT, by way of example, includes such a number of provisions where they become insolvent is an example. But in the JCT, it goes beyond simply saying that that breach entitles for you to terminate. It sets down a whole a timetable of what you need to do with the issue, more often than not, of two notices, when the notices have to be issued, how far apart, and what information has to be contained within those notices. Now, do be aware, you must follow those provisions 100%. And I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit later. As I've already mentioned, the fact that the actual contract calls a certain clause a condition will not be by itself evident that it is in fact a condition. Okay, so what we've done now is to go through circumstances where a party may have committed a repudiation. Let's give two examples. That the employer has brought onto site without good reason and without being allowed under the contract, additional resources on site to carry out works which the contractor ought to have been allowed to complete. That's a repudiation. The employer cannot take away works from a contractor and employ others to do the works. Equally, let's say that the reason the employer has done that is because the, the contractor has removed all his resources and labor from site, but without good reason. He hasn't issued a seven day notice. In such situations, both parties have committed a repudiatory breach. Where there has been a breach, the innocent party is given a choice. They can either accept the repudiation and thereby bring the contract to an end, or what they can do is to affirm the contract and in effect of ex not accept the repudiation, but still require the other party to carry out and complete the works. Under such circumstances, they cannot terminate but they are still allowed to recover damages. So what the important point is, is that there is a choice. 
bring the contract to an end and terminate, or to affirm the contract and have the contract to continue. And the innocent party is given a choice. But for there to be a choice, it has to be clear. The, uh, the innocent party must clearly show, either by their word or by their actions, which of the two options they have chosen. And in, in order to have chosen one of the two options, the first thing is that the party, the innocent party, must have knowledge of the breach. You must be aware of the breach. You can't elect to accept the repudiation until you know of the failure. But there is a second requirement. Having been made aware of the breach, the innocent party must find or be aware of their legal right to choose. And they're given a period of time to find that information out. Now, what we've got to look at is what they have done. And they've got to done something that is so clear one way or another. Now, simply sending letters to the guilty party saying, please complete the works, or please pay me, or please allow me to carry out and complete the works, will not be sufficient to show that the innocent party has affirmed the contract. All they're doing is seeking their, the other party to do what they should be doing under the contract. That is not going to be enough. It must be clear and unequivocal. And the fact there has been a delay in reaching that decision is not going to be a problem unless some third party's involvement is affected. So what would we look for? Well, if I'm saying to you, you know, and I've got resources on site supplementing your labor, if you remove all your resources from site, that's likely to be an acceptance. You have, by your conduct, accepted my repudiation of removing the labor resource from site. If I write to you saying, you've repudiated the elect to accept, that again is likely to be an acceptance. We need to look at what are the exact facts. Now, what quite often happens is that there is arguably a breach of repudiation by both parties. Let's say, for example, I have not paid you. You've then walked off site without issuing a seven day notice of intention to suspend. You know, both parties have done something that maybe they ought not to have done. And where there has been a breach by both parties, it's simple. Whoever repudiated first, the other party has the option to elect to accept first. So I'm just going to say that again because it is vitally important. So in my situation, I've just said, whoever repudiated first is likely to is the, likely to have the other innocent party having the option to elect to accept. So let's just say, for example, I've indicated I've not paid you your final, some final monies that are fundamental. It is a condition. You have not issued a seven day intention to suspend, but have walked off site. The first breach is the failure to pay. But has the final date for payment elapsed or not? By remove walking off site, if that was an election to accept the repudiation, then the contract is terminated. But if at the date the party walked off, they didn't have the right to terminate, they've repudiated. And where a party seeks to terminate, where they didn't have a legal right to do so, that in itself will be a repudiation as well. So very simply, we're looking at which party repudiated first. And that can be very difficult because one party may be arguing it's a failure to proceed with due diligence. 
Another party might be saying it's a failure to pay. And in both those circumstances, it may well be the case there was not a repudiation. And then if one party then believing there's been a repudiation then seeks to terminate, that in fact is the repudiation. And as you can see, this can quite often be very, very complicated. Once there has been a termination, what is the result? Well, the number one is the two points there is, first of all, the innocent party has no further obligation under the contract. So if there are defective works or works that are incomplete, that, let's call it the contractor in this situation is the innocent party, that contractor no longer has the obligation to complete those works. They don't have an obligation to complete those works. You can't seek to recover the costs of completing those works because there's been no breach in that regard. So all these counterclaims at the end of the job where there's been a termination, sometimes an employer cannot recover those costs because they have repudiated the contract. And the contractor therefore has no longer any obligation to carry out and rectify defective works. However, any rights that occurred pre-termination are retained. So where an employer has notified of defects before the termination and given it, for example, a seven day notice to repair and there's failure to be, failure by the employer contractor to do so, then the employer may have a right to rectify those defects and recover the costs. But following a termination, the innocent party is released from all further obligations. And secondly, they are entitled to damages of their loss and which would include, for example, a loss of profit on those works that they were not allowed to complete. As I've mentioned, rights acquired before the termination are retained by both parties, and provisions for arbitration and adjudication are retained. And indeed, as I've mentioned, it is quite often the case that the issue of which party terminated does go to adjudication. Another one I will emphasize, which is often a problem, is that following a termination where it is under the common law, as opposed to under the contract, is the right for liquidated damages may be lost by the employer. And it's the triple point case. And in this case, what they looked at is what was the provisions for LDs? And will the LD say that they will continue to run until the contractor has completed the works, but the contractor will never complete the works because his contract has been terminated, the liquidated damages fails. Because in theory, the liquidated damages would run forever. This is one very good reason why quite often there is a huge benefit for the employer to terminate under the contract rather than under the common law. Now, there are provisions within contracts saying that the termination should not be given unreasonably or vexatiously. And there are cases that dealing with that, and it is where the employer or the contractor's reason for termination was with an ulterior motive to oppress, harass, or annoy. Which I find a bit strange because when I found um, people get into termination, they often are very upset and do want to annoy the other party. But what we were really looking at was, was the termination reasonable? Let's just say you had a justified reason to terminate but there's only a very small amount of work left to be carried out. And the contractor has shown himself very willing and able to carry out that work, but you still had a right to terminate. And you decide because it's far better for you to do it, then this clause may cause you a problem. Um, this is just to emphasize that most contracts and JCT is a prime example that it is retaining the common law rights. So notwithstanding we've got express provisions for termination, you can terminate under the common law. As far as in the main contracts terminating uh, the employment, 
The reason, as I've mentioned, is, is that the contract provisions are retained. And one prime example under the JCT is that following termination under the contract, you pay no more monies to the contractor. That's what the contract says. You don't pay any more monies to the end of the making good defects period. You're also able to use their plant and materials on site. As you can see, this could be a major benefit to you. I've also mentioned that your liquidated damages may well continue to run. So there is a huge benefit in terminating using the contract provisions. So why would you ever terminate under the common law? Well, the first reason is, is because as soon as you have terminated, all the contract provisions disappear. They no longer exist. The contract has been brought to an end. And as a consequence, you can at that date then look into the account. So I've seen people terminate because of the need to have a further valuation done immediately, particularly where there's been a previous smash and grab by way of example. Uh, the other reason is, is because of time. There may be a reason that you need to get rid of the particular contractor off-site today, and you cannot wait the two-week period that is required, maybe in issuing the first initial notice of termination, the warning notice, and then have to wait the further period of time before issuing the termination notice. And it does seem to me, for some reason or other, that particularly employees and contractors are quite often impatient and will not allow the full period to elapse. So on this timing and content of notices, you must ensure that you comply with the contract. So where it says you shall issue it by recorded delivery, issue it by recorded delivery. Where it says you must set down the grounds, set down the grounds. Where it says between the first notice and the second notice, you must wait 14 days, make sure you wait 14 days, not 13 days. Where it says that you have to issue two notices, do ensure that the first notice can be seen to relate to the second notice. So let's say you issue a first notice six months ago. Quite often, that will be too far away to then issue the second notice. They must see, be seen to relate to each other. So on these issue of notices, make sure you comply. Because if you fail to comply, what you've actually done is committed a repudiation yourself, and which may allow the other party to elect to accept your repudiation and bring the contract to an end, entitle them, them to damages rather than you. So to summarize, as I said to you, the first ever job I was on had loads of problems with termination and people not doing it properly. Now, it will come as no surprise for you, for you to hear me to say that in my experience, you are best to get legal advice before terminating. Because I would say in a considerable number of times where people seek to terminate, they do the quite the opposite. What they actually do is to repudiate the contract, thereby electing the other party to terminate and seek damages. So do be aware. Okay, Julie, are there any questions? Yes, Richard, there are indeed. Um, that provoked a, a storm of questions. First question in, does the inclusion of a detailed program in a subcontract amount to a sequence that the subcontractor must adhere to to be deemed to be working with due diligence? Almost definitely not. Um, unless the contract express includes express provisions on how it will work, it is most likely to fail. There's a case, if memory serves me right, called, um, I think it's, it's Mullally, and it may be Mullally, I can't remember who it is, but Mullally is one of the parties. And what they actually included within their contract was, um, in effect, a program wasn't called that thing was called an activity schedule um, and it had a whole set of periods in it um, and Mullally terminated because they said um, that the other party hadn't met with those requirements and it was found that the contractor uh, that, the, that uh, the contractor didn't have that obligation 
because that particular program was inconsistent with all the other provisions within the contract. So put simply, just including is not a program is not sufficient. Because let me give you an example. If you're going to delay the contractor for one of those activities, do they get an extension of time? They do if the ultimate completion date is delayed, but they don't get an extension of time for each and every one of the activity bars on the program. There's an inconsistency. How can you keep the contractor to a program in each of the bars when you can't award them an extension of time? It just simply doesn't work. So to, to try and impose a program on them, you have to be able to give them extensions of time for the bars shown on that program. Okay. Um, does the fact that a portion of the works are covered by a defined provisional sum under the contract allow an employer to employ another contractor to carry out these works? Um, or is the employment of others to carry out these defined works a breach on the part of the employer? Um, I've been a contractor and I've often claimed it, <laughs> but you have no entitlement. It's provisional, I underline. Provisional. In other words, I'm not saying you have to do it. You may do it, right. you may not. So the fact that they haven't instructed or they've omitted a provisional sum is not a breach of contract and you're not entitled damages. Doesn't mean that you can't try and claim them though. <laughs> okay. Um, where a contractor removes certain possibly key subcontractors from site or does not engage other key subcontractors to progress the works, but not all, is this repudiation? Very possibly, yes. If they're showing they're not willing or able to carry out the works, then it is indicative that they don't want to do it. So it may be evidence of failing to proceed with due diligence, or it may be showing to the employer that they no longer wish to carry out the work because they're saying, well, we're not going to employ these people. They're there by saying they're not meeting with their obligations, and therefore it can be a repudiation. But what you're going to have to show is, is it is a complete failure. It is basically a fundamental breach of contract or a breach of condition. So if you can show, for example, look, that is needed up there today, and they're not doing it. Why are they not doing it? Why are they not placing the orders? Why are they not interested in doing it? And if you can show that they're not doing it because they simply are not bothered, they can't, don't want to, then it's likely to be a repudiation. Okay. And would the contractor still be liable for the 12 month defects period for all works undertaken prior to termination? Say that one again, Julie. Would the contractor still be liable for the 12 month defects period for all works undertaken prior to termination? Uh, depends upon the contract, uh, whether it's been terminated under the common law or under the contract. Um, so, it's a slightly more complicated answer. So let's work on the basis that the contractor, the employer has repudiated. As soon as the employer is repudiated, the contractor has no longer any obligation to carry out any works and hence to carry out any defects in the defects period. The obligation is gone, the contract's come to an end. So what you would possibly do is to say that there has been an abatement in value. We don't pay for works that are wrongfully carried out, but you cannot seek to recover costs associated with rectifying them because the contractor is not in breach. Where the employer has terminated, then it's obviously the contractor remains in breach and therefore is responsible for all those defects. Right, okay. Thank you very much, Richard. That seems to be the questions for this morning. Um, so there's a little flurry there. Thank you very much, everybody. The recording of this will be on our YouTube channel, which is at Silver Shemmings. Um, and obviously certificates will be sent out later. As I sent a note round whilst the uh, seminar was underway, there was, was a slight change to the slides. Those are now available from the website in the usual place. Uh, if you go onto the training and look at the online seminars button, you can find them there. Thank you very much for your time, Richard. Thank you for that great explanation. And um, we will speak to you all again soon. Everyone have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.